Uh, thank you for joining us uh, at this event. Uh, my name is Chang Ta, and I'm associate professor at the Faculty of Education, York University, and also I'm the interim director of York Center for Asian Research. I'm the chair of today's event. So, um, so now um, we're going to start uh, today's um, session, and uh, I will acknowledge. Um, the land um, first. Uh, this is an event hosted by York University, even though it's now uh, the virtual format. I will acknowledge the land from York University. So York University recognizes that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by Anishinaabeg Nation and Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And Huron, Huron Wendat, it is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon, One Bone Belt Covenant, agreement to peacefully share and kill for the Great Lakes region. Now, um, let me move on to introduce today's um, speaker and discussant. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, two great scholars joining us. So let me uh, introduce the uh, speaker first. Our speaker today is Dr. Noah Picas. Noah is currently the Associate Provost at Duke, Duke, Duke University, and also the Dean for Academic Strategy and Learning Innovation at Duke Quinshan University, where he oversees the Institute for Global Higher Education. Duke Quinshan, uh, my understanding, is offshore campus of Duke University uh, in China. And that's where uh, I met Noah first. He was formerly the chief academic officer at the Minerva Project, director of Duke's Kanan Institute for Ethics, founding director of the Institute for Emerging Issues at North Carolina State University, and the cohort coordinator of the Arizona State University, Georgetown University Academy for Innovative Higher Education Leadership. His new book is a co-authored book, um, The New Global Universities, Reinventing Education in the 21st Century. Uh, that's also the focus of today's event. Uh, he will speak about his new book. The book came out only a couple months ago with the uh, Princeton University Press. His previous publications include Two Face and Legends, Immigration and American Civil, sorry, um, Immigration and American Civic Nationalism, Immigration and the Citizenship in the 21st Century, and the Liberal Arts and the Sciences Innovation in China. Uh, Dr. Noah Pickers received his PhD in politics from Princeton University. Uh, now let me introduce our discussant, Professor Lisa Phillips. Uh, Professor Lisa Phillips was appointed Provost and the Vice President Academic of York University in 2018. And she's now serving an additional five year term until June, 2027. She joined York in 1996 and is a professor of law in Oscar Hall Law School, holding an LLB from University of Toronto and LLM from York. She was called to the Bar of Ontario in 1988. As the provost, she's dedicated to enhancing the student's experience through, ad ad sorry, through advertising and supporting initiatives, establishing innovative programs that prepare students to become engaged global citizens and creating excellent learning experiences on the York University's academic plan. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. So now I'm gonna give the floor to Dr. Noah Pickers. 
Um, great, thank you. Uh, Chung, can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Uh, well, I want to thank you in, in, in particular for uh, this invitation and Provost uh, Phillips for joining this conversation. Whenever you write a book, and especially one like this about universities, being able to engage with leaders at different universities is just I ideal, because in many ways, the, the impetus behind this book is to see if we can free up our imagination a little bit uh, about how universities might be constructed, um, not so far that we free it up where it's completely in the imagination, it actually has to be stood up and sustainable, but that it's also something uh, new and trying out different forms of how we structure higher education. As uh, Zacheng pointed out in his introduction, you may have noticed that I have a bit of a peripatetic uh, academic uh, career. Uh, I've mostly been at Duke. I've certainly been working in China for a while. Uh, I've worked with Arizona State and with Minerva Project and some different institutions. Um, and all of that I didn't realize was preparation for doing this book. And what I'd like to do today is uh, three things. One is to uh, take you back in time a little bit, first to 2017 and then 2012, to give you a sense of the origins of this project and um, uh, the context for what we're doing. And then to describe for you uh, a number of the startup universities from around the world that we profile in the book. And finally, to talk about some of the successes and challenges that I think these institutions encountered and what they might mean for, for all of us. Um, so if I go all the way back to 2017, which is uh, when uh, I met Chiang and we were in uh, Kunshan, uh, China, I was tapped to help build a curriculum and hire a faculty for a joint venture campus between Duke University and Wuhan University, uh, uh, Kunshan Duke Dashui, Duke Kunshan University. And Chung participated in um, a summit we had that led to this report about uh, liberal arts and sciences in, in China at the time. And that um, that report um, came out of and was connected with uh, what you might call a WeChat moment um, uh, in in China, um, where certainly in the private sector and very much the government had been calling and continue to call for various kinds of reforms in in uh, higher education, things that will not seem uh, uh, far off, I imagine, to many of you, wherever you're located. Reform general education, make it more interdisciplinary, do better teaching, lifelong learning technology, and so forth. And one of our colleagues, uh, Zhao Yong uh, from the University of Kansas, who was with us at that conference, had a lovely way of capturing this notion, those of you who know uh, WeChat in China know that it started out as uh, an app like it was a messaging app, QQ. It was like any other uh, uh, early social media or messaging uh, technology. And they could have kept, the Tencent, the company could have kept just improving it, but they ended up doing something of a leapfrog and creating in this one app um, a, 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 an ecology in which you could not only do messaging and social media and do your banking and buy your tickets for the train and any number of other things, um, but it really leapfrogged over what, for many of us in the West, are still three or four or five different apps we have to use, um, as opposed to holistically integrating into this one uh, one app. Now, there's a question mark at the end of that statement of a WeChat moment um, as to whether uh, certainly in China, which particularly has the centralized and top-down approach in policymaking in general and, and, and in education, certainly, um, 
whether or not you can create that, you, you can issue these edicts, but whether you can actually make good on them is, is a challenging question. Um, so that's how Chung and I got to know each other. Um, I am not, he of course is a scholar of higher education and knows more about China than I will uh, ever learn about Chinese higher education. Um, but I came to this from a background um, in uh, higher education in the US context. And if I go back all the way to 2012, I had a leave um, where um, I spent a, a year basically visiting universities in the US and elsewhere, looking at how they did strategic planning. And uh, a colleague of mine, turned out I didn't know him, Brian Penpraise, he's the astronomer, I'm the ethicist. And we met in Chicago in a bar in 2012 because he was doing the same kind of fellowship. And we discovered then that we shared, despite that he's in the natural sciences, I come out of the humanities and social sciences. He was teaching at a liberal arts college. I was teaching at a research university that we really shared a lot in common, that there are many things to love about higher education, about how students in particular can find new talents, that you can have deep forms of learning, and that at their best, universities are deliberative and they uh, are longstanding. They don't always go with the fads. On the other hand, we quickly identified there were a lot of things that we hated as well in our lover's quarrel with uh, higher education. One was how incoherent most university curricula were in our minds. Another was the lip service given to actual, genuine, deep and committed and high quality teaching in the service of learning. And, and the third is the technical term Michael Crow from ASU uses this institutional isomorphism, which of course all of you will recognize as basically in the higher ed context, the way in which if you're uh, certainly in the US uh, context, the uh, wherever you are in the rankings, you try to look like the those ranked above you. And so it um, the desire to be isomorphic and to, since nobody knows what makes up a quality higher education, we look to rankings, which are driven by prestige and really bring enormous constraints on our ability to change in higher education. Despite these books on your slide and many others talking about new and different ways to do it, there are a lot of constraints on actually bringing about change. Um, I note in this slide, uh, both Clark Kerr and the University of California Master Plan from the 1960s and Kerr's wonderful statement that there's something remarkable about the structure of a university that has changed so much over so many centuries when everything else has seemed to uh, 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 wither and shift and um, not have that stability. On the other hand, the flip side of that stability is captured in this book published recently. Brian Rosenberg was president of a liberal arts college for 20 years, and you can see it all in, in his title what we call shared governance in higher education can sometimes mean whatever it is, I'm against it. That the whole distributed decentralized shared governance, which makes for deliberation and longstandingness also makes it enormously difficult to actually create a strategic plan or drive a priority that is compelling, that is challenging, that is trying to do something different. And so we end up with so many of our universities looking like each other. And that's an odd thing for an institution devoted to discovery and creation. So Brian, my astronomer colleague and I, uh, over the years, I was pulled into helping to create this university in China. He helped to create Yale and US in Singapore. And we discovered that although there's a lot of doom and gloom, uh, certainly in the US context about the cost and quality of higher education, its inability to change, um, uh, it's the political issues, um, 
that there were a lot of different universities around the world, in Africa, in Asia, in the Middle East, in North America. Um, I, I only don't list Europe and Latin America here because the editors made us uh, trim the book. It's already rather long and they, they said we couldn't have every everyone covered. So we ended up focusing on eight universities that had been founded in the 21st century. And we really had a very simple question that I think many of us in the academy have, have often asked, sometimes out loud, sometimes not, which is, if you had a blank page, if you could start a new university today, what would you do? How would you structure it? Um, what choices would you make that were the same as what we have, and what would you do that was 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 quite uh, different in this way? And we were struck by, with all the clouds and the the gloom in the West, that the sun was shining all over the world on these startup institutions. That was the original name of the book, Startup You. And we got equally interested in the people who were doing this. These are some of the founders or the leaders of those eight institutions. And they come from a wide variety of backgrounds inside and outside of academia. Pericles Lewis, who's up here on the, it's the right on my side, maybe the far left on your screen, is a Canadian uh, uh, who'd been a comparative literature scholar at Yale and gave up his comfortable life in New Haven to start this new venture in Singapore. Uh, right next to him, sort of on an angle, is Fred Swanaker. Uh, Fred left his home country of Ghana when he was four years old with his family, escaping uh, on foot uh, a political coup, had to move through three other uh, un uh, nations in Africa because of instability, and ended up uh, concluding that the problem he believed Africa was facing was a problem of leadership and that he needed a new generation of leaders who would be both effective and ethical. And the way to do that would be to start and build 25 new universities all over Africa that would bring a distinctive approach to creating these new, uh, these new, universe, uh, these new leaders through a new university system. And each one of these people up here has a wonderful origin story. I wish I could tell you about all of them. But in the interest of time, let me tell you a little bit about what they what they built. And I'll, I'll put it into um, four sort of rough and tumble categories. Um, uh, they, they could be arranged in a lot of different ways. But let me start with the Olin College of Engineering. It's the oldest school in our study, uh, uh, and it, it um, emerged out of a study from the National Academy of Engineers, of Engineering, which said essentially that the way we train engineers in higher education is at odds with the problems that we face in the world, and that we are training too many engineers in a rote way where they get a lot of memorization and they don't do anything hands-on until the end and that they are focused narrowly on uh, uh, important practical problems like how do you stand up a building so it doesn't fall down, but not on the grand challenges that we face, whether it's in technology or health or any number of areas where engineers can or should participate. And essentially, they were looking for a way to bring more hands-on experiential and creativity to engineering education. And you may not think of creativity being the hallmark of what you want in an engineer, but to solve these problems, they believe that was the missing part. And I love this quote from Rick Miller, the founding president, is that you can't teach people to be creative by giving them a book. It's like giving them a book on how to swim. They have to actually get in the water and move their arms. And so Olin built a experiential hands-on approach. The first thing students did when they arrived 
is they were put into groups and were told to build a pulse oximeter without any instruction. And they just had to figure out what to do there. And the whole ethos of the university was very much, we're not gonna have departments, we're not gonna have tenure, we're gonna focus on high quality teaching. Everything has an expiration date where we can actually have adaptable creative structures. So we don't say we have a curriculum and every 25 years we'll look at it and make a few tweaks. We're gonna continually be improving how we go about doing this. So the institution sought to embody what it was doing in the education of its students. Here are two other examples, um, two institutions that are very different in some ways, but um, alike in terms of their emphasis on the two elements I mentioned here of skills and networks. So African Leadership University, which Fred Swanaker created um, and was really born out of an idea um, that uh, you couldn't get high quality education, couldn't get sufficiently high quality education at a low enough cost in Africa, and that you couldn't get it in a way that built the students' confidence, didn't just give them an accounting degree, but like Olin, was focused on solving real world problems um, and could help develop the, the students in a way that they didn't have to depend on a large group of PhDs who were doing research, which they didn't have in many African nations and they couldn't afford. And he ended up, he's raised almost three quarters of a billion dollars um, and has built uh, two campuses, one in Mauritius, one in Rwanda, a set of regional hubs has gone online uh, in a variety of ways. And the students there focus on what is their mission that they want to have in their life and how do they gain the knowledge and teach themselves and teach each other, often accessing high quality online education um, and then making it their own rather than a major in a specific area. Similarly, Minerva University uh, is based, came out of San Francisco in a Silicon Valley kind of ethos and it designed a system where students from around the world um, would, uh, over four years, move to seven different cities across the globe. And they would do all of their education. You might say, well, that sounds expensive. And how do they do that? Well, they did their education in a highly uh, uh, bespoke online setting. Um, where all the faculty were focused on the most active forms of learning uh, because you had to do that if you were gonna be doing it online. And like African Leadership University, but even more developed, both of Minerva and ALU said, knowledge is now so infinite that all of our students hold in, and all of us hold in our hands, um, more knowledge, more content than we could ever know, right? It's all in our phones. What we need to do is pay less attention to just what is the content, what is the 10 courses or 15 courses in political science that you must do, and what are the underlying skills that all students need to learn, whether it's about communication or creativity or critical thinking or collaboration, how do you teach those skills? And not in the loose way many of us do. Oh, I teach critical thinking by giving my students exams, or I teach creativity by having them put on a play. But how do you actually take the, uh, uh, I think Minerva now has 85, ALU started with 135. They broke their concepts down into 80 plus uh, skills that they believed they rooted in the academic literature and they wanted to make sure if a student was learning something about creativity in a literature course that that student could connect it in their second year with a physics course or if they were learning about feedback loops in nature, they could apply feedback loops in solving social problems. And so they developed this whole underlying skills curriculum um, rather than simply saying, 
here is gen ed and here is your major. A third example would be what I would call high quality, lower cost uh, schools that enabled students who often would have gone abroad, excuse me, would have had to travel abroad to Canada, to the US, to the UK, to Australia, for the kind of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary liberal arts and science education that they found hard to get at home in places that were still really struggling under a colonial form of uh, education. How could they offer that same high quality education that people were getting in the West, but, uh, but do it at home at a far lower cost, often one sixth the cost, still expensive, but much cheaper than if you had to uh, study abroad. And also, how could they do it in a way that uh, resisted the colonial impulse to train students for narrow bureaucratic uh, uh, service jobs, but would embrace the nature and the culture and the history and the civilizations that they were part of in their countries and their regions, so that they would not be having to go abroad and then, you know, if you come from Vietnam, go to the US and maybe take one course on Vietnam, instead having it built into the entire curriculum that they were having in, uh, and therefore becoming uh, more of a bridge between uh, the culture at home and the international world. One last example um, would be uh, some of those schools, particularly ALU, Minerva, um, uh, Ashoka, Ashesi, the others I've mentioned, many of them were focused on not only high quality and uh, new forms of teaching and learning and interdisciplinary work, but they were um, uh, they were also trying to drive down cost and increase access. Here are two examples that were lavished with money, enormous sums of money for NYU, Abu Dhabi, and Yale, and US. So there was no attempt here about question of going to scale. Um, but there was a deep focus on if we at this moment where we have the clash between local, national, and global uh, uh, nations and interests and leaders, could we train a truly global student body from uh, uh, either all from around the world, in the Yale case, half from Singapore, half from around the world, and could we create a global curriculum as Yale and US did, where students didn't just study the West or the East in some abstract way, but they really had an exposure to different cultures and civilizations and understandings. And could they, in the NYU Abu Dhabi case, actually engage their differences as opposed to, uh, again, the notion that if you were in uh, the Middle East and you wanted a high quality education, you would often go to some place like the US and then you would be the 10% of international students lost on an American campus. So these are four kinds of categories, if you will, that our schools fell into. They, you could categorize them in many different ways, um, uh, but this is one, I think, helpful way to think about them. Let me move to the final section here and talk about um, what we saw as some of the successes and some of the challenges that these institutions encountered um, and that we might learn from. The, the first thing I wanna say about the successes is many of these schools started small, some of them intend to stay small. And so our approach in this book was, we think there's enormous value to the focus um, certainly in North America on how do you increase lower costs and increase access. And often that means going to scale. So that might be in Georgia or it might be uh, ASU or Southern New Hampshire. And there's a lot to be said for how to do good high quality education in those settings. I think our view was not so much opposed to that 
but just that it is hard when you go to 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 and online to have that highest level of quality. And that there's something to be said also for looking and taking a pluralistic approach to impact by seeing how uh, tens and twenties and hundreds and maybe more schools can innovate and experiment and we can learn from each other rather than always having to make it one single larger institution. But to do that, you actually have to overcome some of these barriers I talked about at the beginning. In particular, how are you gonna have any impact if you're not Harvard or Yale or uh, Princeton? How do you have an impact if you don't have hundreds of years in a giant endowment? And these schools have been very innovative, I think, in uh, ALU, it was ranked the number one company in Africa, number 39 in the world. So that's a different kind of ranking, but it's because they had an interesting mix of private and public uh, uh, nonprofit and private sector approaches. <clears throat> Minerva University has been ranked the most innovative university in the world by one ranking uh, system. And you can see MIT, this was brilliant. MIT flipped the script. <clears throat> MIT, sorry, MIT uh, uh, listed Olin as the best engineering education school in the world. Now that's a pretty remarkable thing to say when you're MIT. And, but the point is you have to play the rankings game if you're going to have an impact when you don't have size or giant resources. The other thing is many of these schools had a demonstration effect, which is to say that, uh, take Ashoka University in India as an example. They pioneered a lot of this work. They then, the government then embraced this in many of their policy plans and other entrepreneurs started to found these schools across, I think there were I don't have the numbers right off the head of top of my head, but 200 plus uh, innovative universities followed after Ashoka is, is, a, is a rough number. Um, uh, Fulbright has, has sought to open up space for other universities in Vietnam. And so the point is that there can be a demonstration effect in the region, not just for your school. I've talked about cost and quality. I've talked about future national and global leaders. The point is these schools have attracted attention and notice. Okay, but let's move away from prestige and rankings. That's important to making a dent, but what are you actually doing? And here I wanna just highlight four items that I think I've talked a little bit about each of these. Um, but what is distinct about many of these universities we featured is that sometimes a university I'm familiar with, certainly in the U.S., is they'll have a little incubator on the side to try out new things. In this case, many of these universities themselves were the incubators of doing things differently. And what did they do? Well, they basically determined that the more global their student body was, the more they had to really rethink and build a genuine engaging common core, as opposed to the core, the sort of gen ed requirements that most students, you know, struggle with and faculty feel like, oh, we just have to deliver it, but it's not important. They made the core of what is offered central because they knew that their students needed to overcome being strangers to each other, and they needed to learn from each other and about each other. I've emphasized the ways in which many of these universities eschewed simply having a chemistry major, a history major. They would create an economics and history major or a computer science and leadership major or any number of other more creative ones. And they would build experiential education in throughout. I talked earlier about that focus, not just on content, but on skills. And then last, this idea that, you know, whenever we uh, assess people for tenure, right, we have this very careful analysis, uh, or we think it's careful of their research. 
And then we have, how did they do in teaching? And we say, well, I don't know, she got good teaching evaluations. And maybe at York, you have a better way of doing that. But I think in general, we're quite bad at it. And many of these universities essentially said, if we care about education, we have to do two things. One is we have to really incentivize and reward teaching quality, in some cases making it the only focus of the university or research not being absent, but being secondary. And we have to recognize there is a science of learning. There are better and worse ways that we know of teaching. It's not just what student evaluations say. These are things that I think are important to these universities and that have lessons for those of us in established universities who can't just start all from the beginning, but nonetheless could, I think, uh, conjure with some of the, what, what they've done here. Okay, let me close with two reflections on challenges. So the first is the challenge about the global and the local. Uh, Many of these universities, as you can see in their slogans, Yale and US College was in Asia and for the world. And the notion was bringing the Western liberal arts to, uh, to Asia and to Singapore in particular. And I think the faculty were actually very careful in trying to construct a more global curriculum but inevitably questions got raised about, well, what do you mean by Asia? What counts as Asian? And in many cases, Singaporean students found there was a lot of Chinese and Confucian influence being paid attention to, less to the local culture. Um, in, uh, at African Leadership University, there was strong resistance to Fred Swanaker having come back from Stanford in Silicon Valley and this notion that we were teaching global solutions. And they really wanted an African university for Africans by Africans, right? You all know, know the historical residence there of that kind of saying. And there was a feeling about, a, you know, a worry about colonial, a sort of new colonialism. Maybe the deepest criticism, I think, can be seen in NYU Abu Dhabi's aspiration um, for what John Sexton had called a secular ecumenism. In other words, a, a way in which um, we all engage across our differences and we don't give up those differences, but we deeply interrogate them. And uh, I think questions were raised about that in two ways. One, some students and faculty still felt, well, the reading lists are too Western and colonial. And then there was the opposite criticism. The criticism was, no, this, what happens here is you say that this is just a liberal arts education, but really by teaching students to uh, uh, interrogate texts, to uh, identify the individual as the arbiter of truth, um, uh, that they were essentially the very form of a liberal arts education was undermining communities that were based either politically on authoritarian structures or even more fundamentally undermining communities that were based on more commu communal ethoses or tradition and not this notion of just individual uh, endless self-development uh, uh, from a Western perspective. Um, I like this concept we developed at uh, Duke Kunshan University we call rooted globalism as an aspiration to not be global citizens as if that was some neutral phrase, but to recognize that there are tensions between being local, national, and global, and that navigating amongst those tensions and commitments and understanding what you need to navigate is crucial to in, for students and also for us large, largely for the larger future of the, uh, of the world. So there's a whole lot of issues we might unpack there, but let me turn to one last um, challenge, which is the tension not of what you build, but of how you build it. And here I'm gonna talk about 
gas and brakes or audacity and flexibility because you need both of these things. On the one hand, there are so many constraints on starting a new university. Accreditation is, is barely the minimum there. Where do you get the money from? How do you hire the faculty? How do you get accreditation? And the only times these worked is when the leaders and the founders had a truly audacious vision to transform an entire colonial system of education, right? Or create a new generation of leaders in Africa or to fundamentally restructure in, uh, intellectual life along interdisciplinary lines. There had to be some grander audacious claim. And the founders often had to stick to that because there were so many pressures to make it look like the established institution. So at one point, uh, Fred Swanaker wrote this article, Five Reasons Not to Work for ALU or ALX, which is the online version. He said, look, we're, what happened was he was getting a lot of people saying, oh, we got tabbed by Forbes magazine said, ALU is the Harvard of Africa. So now we want to look like Harvard. We want to be researchers. We want to be prestigious. We want to uh, make it hard to get in. And he said, no, I want to make it easy to get in. And I don't want us to focus on research. I want us to figure out how to scale something that is not conventional, is not going to be a safe bet, and is going to have an impact not only in Africa, but globally. That was painful. Over the course of two years, half the faculty and staff either were fired or left. He had to double down on, we're not going to be the Harvard of Africa. We are going to be something totally new and better and different because we're trying to create a new generation of leaders, not trying to create 500 students who can be Harvard, go to Harvard. Um, as that indicates, though, the audacity has to be paired with flexibility. So at Olin College, for example, they still refer to the bouncy castles moment and they have to do, and if you know what I mean by a bouncy castle, right? Those kids' birthday parties where they blow up, they put a lot of air in it and you go and you take your shoes off and jump around. In the first year at Olin, they so over-designed the curriculum. They so had so many ideas that the students were in tears. They couldn't keep up. And they just had to cancel classes one day. And they had to put the bouncy castles out on the lawn. And they had to figure out um, how to start over and uh, immediately start iterating and prototyping what they had done. Uh, this last quote is from Mark Somerville, the provost, who makes the larger point that startups are like gardens and everyone plants their seeds, but you don't know how to weed it. And people just want to keep adding stuff on. And you have to find a way of adding and innovating by substitution as opposed to by addition. And every founder we studied needed either to have within him or herself, and frankly, they weren't very good at this. The audacious leaders were not the most flexible, but they had to have teams who could actually say, this is where we need to flex and why. And, um, uh, and that's the larger point here that I wanna close on, which is even in the startup atmosphere, every startup university has a 2.0 moment or moments. Sometimes it happens within two years, sometimes within five, sometimes at 20, but it's normal and necessary. And what we learned over the course of these universities is that the first thing that happens is people panic and they say, oh my God, we've done all these new and different things and it's not working and we're having all this trouble and the students are in turmoil. And it's important to remind people that's normal it's necessary in an audacious project and to stop them from walking back across the familiarity bridge. What do I mean by that? 
at the beginning of my talk, I talked about prestige as an external constraint on innovation. But one of the things we learned in the course of this study is that sometimes the biggest constraints are internal. As faculty, we are all part of a guild and we are trained in certain ways of teaching and learning and doing research. And even when we sign up to start a new university, we panic and we say, oh, well, let's go and, and create a major like everybody else, or let's have a term that looks like everybody else's term. And the trick there is to get people not to panic and just go back to what they had. It is to say, now we need the same intentional, coherent approach as we took in the 1.0 moment. We have to apply it to the 2.0 moment. And the 2.0 moment has to become something like what uh, Mark Somerville at Olin referred to as this culture of continuous iteration and improvement rather than a culture of every 25 years we'll have a curriculum review. Those are some of the things we learned um, about what these schools did and how they did it. And I hope you found it um, interesting and engaging and I look forward to the Provost Phillips comments and conversation with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Laura. Um, this is a really uh, well propelled and inspiring presentation. I'm sure the audience um, would already have some questions, um, but um, hold on. Um, we're going to save the questions and until the end um, after the uh, discussions um, comments. Um, um, before I invite Professor Alyssa Phillips to offer her comments, I want to remind the audience there are two ways to ask your questions. One is to enter your questions into Q&A. I can see that and I can read your questions. Or if you prefer to speak directly, you can raise your hands. I can see your hands as well. So now um, let's move on and invite Professor Lisa Phillips um, for your comments. Thank you so much, uh, Zhang. And uh, Noah, thank you. Thank you for writing this book. And uh, thanks to both of you for including me in this discussion because um, this was such a well-timed read for me. Um, I am kind of a, a junkie of higher education literature. My own field um, as a scholar is in uh, taxation law and policy. But I come out of a liberal arts background before I, I went to law school, and it has very much shaped the way I think about the university in my own field. And I, I do want to emphasize that I am commenting today in my capacity as an individual scholar, not on behalf of the institution. But of course, having served as provost and in some other roles does make you want to bring you know, your scholarship to thinking about what is the university, what could the university be? And so I found this tremendously fruitful to read and, and enjoyed it thoroughly, but also took a lot of inspiration from it. And I guess I want to make a pitch and just a very brief comment that we have to think about how to bring these lessons into established institutions. That in fact, um, the startups are, they are a demonstration for us of how you can rethink what the university is and does. And yes, there are many structural disincentives um, to uh, innovation within universities. There's many um, challenges to overcome, but there's lots of challenges in the brand new universities as well. And so that doesn't mean you don't try, that doesn't mean you don't uh, struggle through those. And I think that we're at a productive moment right now because it's a scary moment. And it's a moment where higher education is really under threat in Canada and I think in other places in the world. And it is, uh, especially for the liberal arts, it's a bit of an existential moment right now because we are not seeing students coming into these fields, into these majors where so many of us grew up, so many of us find our intellectual roots. They are not attracting students in the same numbers. And that to many of us feels like a huge tragedy. Um, we know that technology is changing everything uh, and it desperately, needs to be in conversation with humanist and behavioral insights. And we have a world that is riven by conflict and polarization. Um, we have a world that uh, you know, is, is being disrupted massively 
where we need graduates who are going to have intercultural knowledge, who are going to have empathy, who are going to be able to imagine a different world. That's all about the liberal arts. It's all about the people. And so how can we do without these disciplines? Um, and so they are more needed than ever, I am convinced. Uh, and yet they are under serious threat. And with that, our institutions are under some quite serious threat. And I think that you know, there's a saying that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And I think that we have to see this as an opportunity, a moment of quite dire threat for um, higher education institutions, for universities, and one that can generate um, an openness to new ideas and a reinvention process that, uh, it, that many of us um, think is, is long needed. Uh, and so, um, so how can we, to me, to me, the, the challenge is how do we make the liberal arts more legible to students of today, to learners of today, as a necessary part of their, um, their development, personal development, transformation, and, and realizing their potential. And, and I think that it, it very much is, I couldn't agree more with the ways in which these new universities, their instinct was, get out of our disciplinary silos. We have to be thinking more broadly and across fields of knowledge. Um, I, I'm sure many of you heard the um, expression T-shaped professionals. So rather than privileging only the advanced deep knowledge in one particular field of knowledge, we have to uh, also cultivate breadth and an appreciation for complexity and being able to bring different um, uh, frameworks to bear on problem solving. Um, I do think that as much as uh, York University, for instance, has always prided itself on being interdisciplinary, and many of us uh, see ourselves as interdisciplinary scholars, I'm really struck by how much we are still rooted in the disciplines and in the departmental manifestation of disciplines. Um, York University had a fabulous moment uh, just this past summer where we hosted the uh, premier social sciences and humanities conference in Canada, it's called the Congress of Humanities and Social Sciences. 10,000 people came from all over the place. It was really outstanding. We centered Black and Indigenous knowledges in a conversation about how to create a more just and sustainable world. It was fabulous. However, uh, so much of it defaulted into individual scholarly associations breaking up and having their own mini conferences. We tried really hard to pull them together in some plenary events, some really exciting signature events that cut across all of the disciplines. But so much of the time, people were spending really in their, you know, somewhat hermetically sealed uh, containers uh, talking about the latest uh, development in in their field. And so it, it's a hard impulse to resist. And so some of the things that um, I look around and see that I think are show promise for the future, even in long established institutions, I look at a place like Waterloo, University of Waterloo, known for its engineering and its sciences, but one of its most popular programs is a program in arts and business. So they are drawing uh, students who see, yes, I want to uh, continue my uh, learning in the humanities and explore broadly um, across uh, you know, liberal arts disciplines, but I also need to feel that I'm gonna be developing some skills in application problem solving, uh, skills that are recognizable to employers out there and bringing these things together. Uh, McMaster University is another one that has done this extremely well. They've got an integrated um, uh, rehabilitation sciences and arts program. Um, they've got an uh, integrated um, business and humanities. And so I think this, this bringing together and infiltrating the liberal arts into some of these other disciplines is, is so much the way we need to go. So um, here's some, some inspiration that, that I took away from the book that can be, I think, deployed at a place like York and many other established universities. So first of all, uh, one of the really um, common themes running through the book I found was co-designing with students. Ha get the students more involved in actually designing the next iteration of what you're going to be um, they're the ones who are your users in a way. They're the ones who have so much to tell you about what they're hungry for, what's inspiring to them, what engages them, and uh, what's missing from the way we, we're used to doing things. Um, 
Another is to rethink quality, right? Not to, um, not to think of it only as depth in one single field, but to think about it as um, being exposed to excellent thinking and faculty across a broad range of fields where you can make these connections across different, different fields of knowledge. Um, a third is to really think about how you're gonna get experiential. How are you gonna build in project-based learning? Um, what is the, the version of co-op that's going to really work for a liberal arts style um, uh, of learning? How are we gonna develop those empower students, right? How are we gonna make them feel like I can not only learn content and work with it and be great at reading texts critically, I can also figure out how to do other things with that content. I can do, I can do active problem solving where there isn't a clear, uh, a, a clear pathway. Um, it strikes me that entrepreneurship is actually one of the ways we could think about the hands-on element um, and project-based element and design thinking element of, of what could be really exciting to do next. Um, I, I wanted to say also uh, something about changing incentives. Uh, how do we actually introduce some new incentives inside our established institutions? And I'd like to offer one example of something that we have done at York that I'm seeing some, um, some very interesting outcomes happening. And that is that we grew a, a stream of our faculty, our tenure stream faculty that is focused on teaching. Uh, and right in their description of their role, of their appointment is pedagogical innovation, scholarship of teaching and learning. And I'm seeing that new cadre of, of faculty, now that they have bigger critical mass at the university, and a bit of a license and a mandate to lead us down the path of, of some, some uh, valuable experimentation. They're creating some new things which are really exciting and have potential to be scaled up. Uh, and so um, that, you know, what we did there is we said, we're going to ask you and, and evaluate you really, and think about your contribution in a different way that we think will liberate you to actually focus on, uh, on pedagogy in some new ways and to do some new things. And not just to cover lots of material in a heavier teaching load, but to actually transform the curriculum and how we're doing things with students. So um, I'll stop there. Um, I could say much more uh, because this really was a very generative read for me. So thank you again for the book and the opportunity to be part of the conversation. I'm looking forward to uh, what others might have to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa, thank you. Uh, for sharing your thoughts and uh, um, and especially um, um, supplementing um, Noah's presentation with such uh, rich uh, Canadian scenar scenarios. Um, those are very interesting. Um, uh, I don't see the questions yet. While we are waiting for the questions, um, perhaps I can take advantage of my chairship uh, by asking Noah uh, a question. Um, 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 almost a year ago, I, I noticed um, University, University of Chicago, they did a survey um, among the Americans about their view of American higher education. I must say the outcomes um, were pretty surprising to me, at least to myself, which is um, the majority of Americans were losing face on higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe um, the overall percentage was a 56 percentage of the surveyed participants. Uh, they didn't believe the higher education was it. Mm -hmm. um, even more surprising that um, the so-called uh, Z generation or Z generation, mm -hmm. uh, the 18 to 34 years old uh, cohort, uh, they were among uh, the most suspicious group mm -hmm. about the value of high education. I believe that percentage was 63%. They didn't believe uh, in high education. So, so what's your take? What's your read of this survey outcome? Uh, what would you recommend as a re resolution? Yeah, I think, you know, universities are one of those things that, um, depending on how you turn the diamond to glint, um, uh, sometimes the same person can, it's sort of like talking about your representative 
in uh, uh, at, at the national level in the U.S. context in, in Congress, right, where you say, oh, I hate politicians, but I love my congresswoman, right? And so it can be, you know, I don't know what the Canadian equivalent is, but I hate Canadian universities, but I love York or whatever that that might be. Um, and so I think that that's um, always been a bit of a feature. But I think there I think there are two things here. One is before you get to Gen Gen Z or whatever the <laughs> newest generations that we're calling are, um, look. Uh, higher education in the U.S., the cost keeps going up and the quality people are paying attention to. There's a lot of doubt about the quality. I don't think online, the pandemic didn't help when parents actually got to see how bad our teaching is. And I don't mean bad because it was done online. I mean, that, you know, we can all understand that that was a challenge. Just bad. How many of our colleagues just stand up there and lecture? And they're bad lecturers, right? Even if they were good, it would be a problem that they're just lecturing, but they're bad. Um, and, and we just, so questions of cost, questions of quality, um, questions of access. And then I think the larger uh, uh, politics, which is, which is a politics from the right and from the left, um, certainly in the U.S. context, where the uh, separation of higher education and of prestige higher education from um, the rest of the culture has just gotten more and more extreme, right? I just don't, I don't think you can deny that. Um, we could talk about the reasons. So I think that leads to a deep distrust, and then you layer onto it the economic aspect. So you're telling me these liberal professors want you to take their courses in, you know, English humanities or whatever studies program, and it's going to cost me a lot of money. And my kid says they don't even go to class because the lectures are boring. So it's not very hard actually to understand how we get there. And I think the point, though, about the younger generation is a really important one, because these are kids who've grown up in this context, hearing these things, seeing these things, right? They are, I don't know what the equivalent of digital native is, but they're digitally native to doubts about higher education, even though it's clear from a financial perspective it will pay off. But they're not seeing the value and they have a deep distrust of institutions. So I, I am one of those inside the academy who wishes that we would say the things we need to say that are properly in our defense. And then spend most of the time acknowledging what is uh, problematic. And, and I think we do the opposite. We spend 80% of the time saying how great we are and 20% of the time saying, well, maybe we need some new program, right? So I, I, I believe, you know, that, the, that physician heal thyself is a lot of what we need to do here. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Um, good points. Now we have a question from uh, Professor Bao Yan Chen uh, from University of Hawaii. Uh, we do have a someone watching us from such a distance. Um, so her question is really about your notion of the rooted uh, globalism. And she was wondering whether you could um, elaborate on that concept and especially um, explain what role it has um, played in your experience of designing and developing liberal arts college in the Asian context, uh, yeah. in particular so the Duke Queensland University. Uh, a lovely question. Thank you. And let me let me tell you the. I'll, I'll try and describe the good parts and 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 the challenging parts. Um, we're very much uh, at DKU in a 2.0 moment uh, right now. Even just five years into the undergraduate program, um, 
So yes, rooted globalism has a strong affinity with rooted cosmopolitanism and Anthony Appiah's work. Um, uh, we could parse that, and and I, I I would you know share my own view about where I agree, where I disagree. Um, but he's a certain certainly a central reading in uh, in that idea, and. Um, the notion at one level is so simple, it almost sounds like common sense to me, but it's it's very much most of the way, most universities are part of a national higher ed system. That's just how universities are funded and supported. And so they tend to reflect, for better or worse, their local and national framework, right? And quite reasonably, we, many of us think that they should not only reflect that, there should, we, we are dealing in a global world. But then you get the, the, you know, the term global citizen, which for the last 30 years is in so many strategic plans. And in, to my mind is a close to vacuous term. Um, I, I, I don't be, I don't want to be totally unfair, but we aren't citizens of any global polity, right? And so you avoid all the hard questions um, when you say, what I think what global citizen is basically saying is take the median upper upper west uh, west side or Palo Alto or give me a Canadian analogy, you know, analogy sit person, and that's who we'd like you all to become. I, I mean, nobody believes that, but that's what it essentially packs in. And the idea of rooted globalism is uh, simply that um, we have our different identities, our histories, our commitments. Um, some of them are local. Some of them are what we would call identities today in the sense of, you know, of, of being a, a gay or being African-American or whatever it might be. Um, uh, uh, ethnic, some of them are in the Chinese context, some of them are Chinese students very much rooted in the Chinese context, right? So there's local, there's identity, there's national, there's global. And what we want to do is engage students in understanding that um, there are tensions amongst those. And that doesn't mean that that's bad, that the heart of their education should be to explore where do those things go together? Where do they align for me individually and for uh, the larger polity? And where are the tensions? And so instead of saying, oh, we're going to have a program on sustainability and everybody immediately talks about all the wonderful sustainable things that we should do that never seem to happen, you talk about why people might have different views of sustainability, why they approach climate change differently. You put a problem and a tension at the heart of an issue rather than a slogan of where the climate change uh, we're going to solve all climate change. And the one of the ways we've tried to do this at DKU is we created three core courses and we and we scaled them by which I mean in year one, the students take a course called China in the world. And the logic is simply, you're from China, but you may not have been exposed to how we're going to teach, teach about China's longstanding interaction with the world or you're from 80 countries around the world and you've just moved to China. We're gonna locate everybody here in that experience first. Then in the second year, we want you to come back and we want you to think about global challenges. Um, and that, right, so you move outward and you engage the global dimension and then in the third year, we have a course, I try to remember its name, but it's essentially uh, focused on the individual level about where do you fit into all this? And that, you know, no three sequence course uh, is going to solve all these, but I give it as a tangible example of how we tried to think through locating students in these different places and showcasing the tensions as well as the possibilities. And I'll just close by saying, you know, the challenge is that, the challenge is that 
at this stage, it's still a vague concept to most people at DKU. All the students and faculty recognize it, they embrace it, but we haven't brought sufficient rigor to it. And so it, 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 it hasn't, a, we have to do that skills work and that more hard uh, uh, boring of the boards um, uh, to actually get through. Otherwise, for rooted globalism, some people think, oh, it's global citizenship. And other people think, oh, it just means obeying the law. So, so the aspiration is there, but the but that's the hard part. Sorry, it's it's a passion of mine, so I give long answers on that one. Thank you, uh, thank you, Nora. Um, and I'm sure um, is um, a good answer to Professor uh, Bao Yan Chen's question. Now we have two more questions, and um, in the Q and A, one is from uh, Professor Ruth He who um, from University of Toronto. And um, she was asking what role have students played and particularly international students uh, who are given the opportunity to challenge and to organize uh, so, in the high, high education innovations and new initiatives? So the answer is both enormously and way too little. Um, so as uh, Provost Phillips indicated, Many of these universities did what they called a co-design or a founding year. They had different terms, but they would uh, they the faculty would design an initial curriculum, and then they would bring in an initial cohort of students, and they'd run it for a year. And then the students uh, would, depending on the university, sometimes those students would go away for a year and then come back and they would join a, 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 another group of students and basically do their first year uh, all over again. It was a little more complicated than that. But the idea was they basically road tested this, they iterated, they prototyped it, and they brought students into that. And they learned, uh, at a minimum, they learned a lot about that they were over designing and the ways in which things didn't make sense from, you know, you it's like that perfect lecture you wrote in your head that everyone thought was boring and too long, right? Um, um, sometimes the students had a deep effect on actually what was, uh, uh, not just sort of how it was done, but what was taught and how they brought their attention to this. In, in Fulbright University, Vietnam, you know, it was a stunning experience. That is all Vietnamese students. And they were teaching a course. Um, well, they had two things. One is they read Animal Farm. Okay. You're reading Animal Farm in Ho Chi Minh City. A lot of parents got very nervous about that. So they had to figure out how do we navigate um, teaching a text like this and not becoming overly political. And yet... Right. In another case, they taught what what is there called the American War, and they showed some excerpts from the Ken Burns documentary. And for many of the Vietnamese students, they had never been exposed to an American interpretation of the war. Now, the goal was not to make them converts to that interpretation, um, but they were tears streaming down their faces because this was this is just not something that you get growing up in Vietnam or certainly going to a university there. So in that sense, students were deeply involved. And I think students have stayed involved in a lot of ways, very active on these campuses. Um, uh, but like everything, you're doing a startup, you're doing a thousand things at once, and it's hard enough, as the provost knows, to manage faculty on this. Um, figuring out a way of keeping the students as the co-curators of this um, is an equally important moment. Um, in, in a way, it goes back, Chung, to your original question, right? Which is, if our students have these doubts and questions, and, and Lisa, as you pointed out, if they're not majoring in certain things, right? Or they are doubt, have doubts about the arts and humanities. Well, you don't answer that by banging them over the head. Right. You you bring them into designing courses on, 
you know, social dynamics and design thinking or whatever it might be. So um, I think we do too little of that. And it's largely because we're still all in startup mode, um, but we neglect it at our peril. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, um, which is from uh, uh, Xiaoya Li. Um, she's wondering whether you could explain um, the similarity and difference uh, between liberal education and the liberal education in your book setting. Let me see if I understand the, the question. Um, so in, in many ways, most of the schools we studied um, draw on the same liberal arts tradition that um, you would recognize certainly in North America um, in the sense of, in very practical terms, you know, there's a notion that you should have some general education, that you should have an area of ma a major, you should have electives and some choice there. That's at the sort of operational part. Um, I think Similarly, the notion that you should learn to 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 echo the provost um, complex thinking and cross disciplinary thinking and intercultural dynamics, and that the basic idea here is it's not vocational. That doesn't mean it doesn't have prepare you for a job or ideally actually a vocation. I think we do better on the job part than the vocation part right now. But it's it's contrary to um, the the notion of education so prevalent in much of the world, which is still I get my major when I, I I'm going I'm going to college I'm going to uni and I'm going to be an accountant and that's what I do. So in that sense, it was very it's very similar. I think the differences um, are are just what I indicated earlier how deeply cross-cultural this was, right? It's one, like at Ashoka University, you know, they started off and they had core courses and it was sort of the great books of Western literature. And it took them a while to not just sort of add on a few Indian texts, but to make those a deep dialogue within the Indian culture um, and between Indian and non-Indian cultures and civilizations. So it was making that far deeper than we often do. Um, similarly, if it was gonna be interdisciplinary, it built that in from the beginning rather than saying, and at your capstone, you will try to apply this to something else. So it was both very much a family resemblance to what we might be used to in a, a Western liberal arts setting. And yet in each case, was trying to bust it open. Um, uh, Lisa, you mentioned experiential education. Um, in so many of our colleges and universities, what we've done is we say there's curriculum and oh yeah, students learn also by experience. So let's have some of that. And the connections between the two are haphazard at best, right? So how do you think about building in um, experiential or co-op uh, kinds of experiences where the concepts that you learn in the classroom are exp then are reinforced in the experiential side and then come back to much more holistic integrated thinking. So my, my, my own view is it, it's like liberal arts and science education squared. And of, of course, what I also have to say is, and particularly in the Asian context, um, it is often just a fool's errand uh, to keep on talking about the liberal arts. I, I showed that report at the very beginning that Chung and I worked on, um, which I probably would title something different today. And it's partly because there's no translation. Chung, you can help me out here. There's no literal translation into Chinese for the liberal arts. Um, you get quality education, you know, uh, uh, or you get... Uh, 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 general education or quality education, or it sounds like people think it's it's studying poetry or it's political. So, and this is not all that different from here in North America, I think, where the question is, 
are we talking about liberal education or are we talking are we talking about that same concept but in ways that are more appealing and less uh, off-putting initially and that also force us as faculty to say i can't just keep teaching my same course or all my courses the same way yes i can offer a medieval renaissance course absolutely but I need to understand how medieval Renaissance is actually connected to the habits and skills of students who are studying other subjects. Thank you. Uh, we still have time to take one more question. Um, so I do encourage audience to raise more question. Um, while we're waiting, uh, perhaps I can ask Lisa a question. Um, which has to do with that point. And I believe, Noah, you made at one point. Um, you know, um, York University is commonly understood as a regional university. Um, if you look at the student population, right, mostly local, and even some, uh, you know, some people call as a commuter uh, students population. Um, so my question is really how, uh, about um, how to balance meeting the local needs and also pursuing the global aspiration at the same time, because uh, we do see that in our academic plan. Yeah, thank you for asking that, because I actually am and more and more convinced that um, universities need to do both. And I think the book really actually strengthened my thinking about that even further, because um, there was the one um, there was the one story about students, and I'm forgetting which of the universities it was, but students coming to say, you have to have something about this place. You have to be rooted here, even though you're bringing this incredibly global group of students and faculty and ideas together. That, you know, why does it matter that we're here in this place doing this? And, um, you know, there, there's something about the, um, you know, the local, the, the power of place that universities have to pay attention to. And even if we are more and more, our student body is international, as is the case at York, um, even, and, and many of our local students actually come from newcomer families who have come from all over the world. So they're exposed to lots of diaspora um, communities and um, ideas and cultures as well. Um, we have to think about, well, how are the people who are living here together sharing this space in this geographic area now with its economic profile and its mix of humanity and its social issues and its, um, you know, its uh, form of government, you know, how, how are they going to prosper and thrive? Um, and uh, what, what is going to make for this place to be as just and sustainable as it can be and as inclusive as it can be? Um, and in order to get there, in order to understand that, though, we, we cannot have a parochial point of view. We have to learn from what's going on in all other parts of the world and be able to situate ourselves in these massive forces, these massive externalities that are buffeting us, you know, one way and the other. Um, and where we're feeling the effects locally of things that are happening often very far away. Um, or are happening on such a scale across the world that to understand why suddenly an industry that provided employment, a secure employment for a whole generation, why that's gone all of a sudden. And so, um, and, and what might come next? Uh, and, and what are the, the lessons we can learn from uh, other parts of the world about how they're addressing um, the need for primary health care in you know, populations that are very diverse? Uh, so I think you have to be both. You have to be both in order to, um, it's not just some sort of ideal of global mindset, for instance. It actually is about trying to get traction to improve the lives of the people who are sharing this community and this space together. So I, I feel quite, quite passionately that somehow you have to be doing both. You have to actually be responsive to your local communities and engage with them, but you cannot be parochial to do that well. Thank you. Yeah, and I think we uh, we don't see any further questions, so we can close on time, just on time. Uh, so I really want to appreciate um, the um, the panelists, uh, both um, Professors uh, Noah Picas and Professor 
Lisa Phillips um, for your um, comments, presentations, and also I want to thank the audience for joining us, um, some joining us from afar, from Europe, uh, from Hawaii. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we're done. Great, thank you. Thank you, that was lots of fun. Bye -bye. Much appreciated. Bye -bye. Loved it. Take care. Bye.